This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And I'm Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. Oh, you smell that? Fall is in the air, at least up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Yes, it was hot as my actual balls today, but it, other than that, it fall is in the air. Yes, it was actually kind of hot this day. But you know what? I got back, just got back from Lake Placid in Boston. Lake Placid was perfect. It was like high 50s, low 60s. Oh, beautiful. Oh, driving through upstate New York and, and New England, going through New Hampshire, Vermont. It was so gorgeous. And then, of course, Boston was a ton of fun. But good golly, am I happy to be back home with my woman and my dog. Oh, gosh. And ready to record an episode. That's right. Fall is in the air, and we are ready to be in spooky season. That's right. Try and catch it, folks. It's falling. Mm Okay. To keep up on what we're doing, feel free to follow us on Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. We're also on TikTok and we're on Facebook. And on our Facebook page, we have a subgroup called Citizens of the Milky Way. That's where everyone can kind of just chat and hang out and post articles and memes and ask questions and things like that. Feel mm. free to check that out. Once again, it's at Citizens of the Milky Way on Facebook. And if one episode a week is just not cutting it. <laughs> Or look me in the eye and tell me it is, you fucking liar. Yeah. You turkey. You can get more. You know what I mean? You can get that extra little piece you're craving of Creep Street. Get your hit. Get your fix. You can get that at patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast. There we have movie reviews, movie commentaries, spoiler casts, short stories, bonus episodes. I mean, anything and everything you could want is up there at patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast. Mm. We have a $2 tier, we have a $5 tier, and we have a $10 tier. Mm-hmm. So no matter what your budget is, we've got you covered. That's right. Oh, man. It's like a it's like a three-tiered cake. It is. And we're just the little bride and groom standing on top. Oh, come on. We have fun. Now, last week, we went all in on Granger Taylor. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A very exciting episode. People seem to have enjoyed it. We have had some positive feedback from that. Thank you so much for listening. And if you haven't listened, we recommend you go back and listen. Oh, please. But Dylan, we're talking about something a little different today, am I right? Something weird, something wacky. Folks, buckle up, strap in, because we are going on a journey tonight, a a creepy one, a weird one. Oh, yeah. Folks, today we're talking about the Van Meter Visitor. Baby. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, you can feel the steam coming off of it. You really can. Let me uh, tantalize your taste buds with my sources here real quick. First, I read a book. Oh, God. A book called The Van Meter Visitor, A True and Mysterious Encounter with the Unknown by Chad Lewis, Kevin Lee Nelson, and Noah Voss. And then an article from Mysterious Universe called The Bizarre Case of the Van Meter Visitor, an Interdimensional Interloper? by Brent Swanser. There was a question mark in case you were wondering. No, I got that. I got that. Thank you for clarifying, though. So this episode is straight... It's a straight-up cryptid episode. Here we go. 
And it's about time we got one in the books. It's been a little while since it's we've... It's been a minute, yeah. I guess Hellhounds are somewhat kind of a cryptid, maybe. True, they true, They flirt true. with it. This one is a bit more obscure, and I was kind of unfamiliar with it, but it is very fascinating. And perhaps just as fascinating as the creature is are the possible theories that may explain it. Ooh. So let's get a bit of history on the town of Van Meter, Iowa. Van Meter is located along the Raccoon River in Dallas County, Iowa, pretty much smack dab in the middle of the state. The town was founded in 1869 and officially incorporated on December 29th of 1877. And keep in mind, my source gives a rather in-depth history of the town up until the incident in 1903, which we will be covering. Obviously, not all of it is pertinent to our story, but I will add what I think is valuable to the story as we go along. In 1878, a mine was developed, and they struck a rich vein of coal. And in no time at all, the mine was sold to the Chicago Coal Company. And in 1879, they set up a team there to manage the operations at the mine. And the man enlisted as the company president was a Mr. J.L. Platt. And despite some setbacks along the way, the mine became a raging success. Some years passed, and management decided to capitalize even more so on the success of the mine, so in 1893, the Platt Pressed and Fire Brick Company was established. A factory was erected right near the mine, and what they would do is they would take the red clay from the mine and the surrounding area and make bricks and tile out of it. And on February 8th, 1893, the president of the company, J.L. Platt, died of complications of heart disease, and his son, J.L. Platt Jr., was put in charge. A few years later, in 1902, when the workers at the mine tried to unionize, The entire mine was actually shut down. Oh, yikes. So, this brings us to the incident. The visitation, if you will. I will. I can and I I will. This happened in 1903, and it happened over just a span of like three days, four days maybe. Hmm. The first person to witness the visitor was a man named Ulysses G. Griffith, or just UG for short. At the time of the encounter, Griffith was in his mid-30s. And a couple years earlier, in 1901, he and his brother even founded the Griffith Brothers Implement uh, that my sources describe as a seed and vehicle implementation business. He was, by all accounts, a very well-liked and respected man about the town. He had a good head on his shoulders, as they say. And Griffith even served on the village council and was even a member of the local chapter of the Masonic Lodge and the Modern Woodsman. So now we jump to the beginning of the incident. Okay. It's early in the morning of September 29th, 1903. And by early, I mean it was approximately 1 a.m. So it's essentially still nighttime. Right, right. But it's technically the morning Mm. of the 29th. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Griffith had a lot of transporting to do as part of his business that he ran with his brother. And he had made this trip countless times for work. And he would usually get back really late. And that was the same case on this night. It was a comfortable early autumn night as UG Griffith rolled into his hometown of Van Meter after his usual deliveries. It's about 1 a.m., so of course the town is quietly slumbering. Griffith is driving down the main road through the center of town when something catches his eye. Up on top of what was the Mather and Greggs building, Griffith saw a light that he hadn't seen up there before. As he drove down the main road, getting closer to it, He looked at it, wondering what it could be. His first instinct was that maybe it was burglars up there trying trying to find a way into the building from on top. Mm. Oh, yeah. But as he got closer to the light, something strange happened. The light suddenly blinked out. And a moment later, it appeared again, this time, on top of the building directly across the street. Hmm. Well, at first, Griffith is a little relieved because this means it wasn't burglars because no human could jump from one roof across a street to the other so quickly like that. Right. And just as it did a moment ago, the light once again blinked out. And that was the last that Griffith would see it. Interesting. So this phantom light. Yeah, that is weird. And it would jumped across the street. It blinked out and then it, it's like it hopped. So it's just a light? As of right now, it's just a light. But we're about to find out what that light is attached to. Yikes. Well, Griffith is kind of perplexed by this. He gets home and he just keeps going over over in his mind like what he had just seen. It was just so peculiar. He wasn't frightened or anything. He was just like, well, what the heck could that have been? 
What the actual hell? It almost looked like a searchlight or something. It was a pretty bright light. Mm -hmm. He was thinking about it so much that he couldn't even really go to sleep that night. He was just so fascinated by this phantom light that he saw. The morning came and Griffith, of course, told other locals about the strange light he had seen. And even some local papers picked up the story. But at this time, it didn't set the community into a frenzy. As wild as it was, everyone, even Griffith himself, assumed there was some sort of logical explanation for what he had seen. But that would all change the following night. Oh no. And it was actually just past midnight, so it's now technically the early hours of September 30th. Okay. Asleep in his room was Dr. Alcott. Alcott kept a room in the back of his practice, and that evening he was getting ready for bed, and off to the west was the quiet rumble of an approaching thunderstorm. It was about 12.27 a.m. when all of a sudden, Alcott was roused from his sleep when a blinding light suddenly flooded into his room from the window. Well, Dr. Alcott quickly gets out of bed and grabbed his gun and rushed out to the street to see what the heck was going on. Immediately, he saw the light, but as his eyes adjusted to its immense beam, to his horror, he saw what this light was emanating from. Standing before him was something unlike anything he had ever seen before. Standing at a height that Alcott had guessed was probably about eight feet tall was a large, bat-like creature. Half human, half bat with large, bat-like wings. Its head almost appeared to be beaked like that of a pterodactyl. Oh, God. And strangest of all, Protruding from its head was a blunt-like horn, almost like a unicorn. And it was from this horn that the bright light was coming from. Oh. Gripping his gun, Dr. Alcott fired five rounds from his six-shot pistol into the strange creature. But alas, even five bullets barely seemed to even get the creature's attention. With only one bullet left in his gun, Alcott quickly ducked back inside of his office and locked the doors. Obviously unable to sleep after what he had seen, Alcott kept a tight grip on his gun until the morning finally came. Well, so here we go. So now we know what it's coming from. It's a big-ass, bat-like creature. Mm. Eight feet tall with a sort of pterodactyl-like head and this protruding horn thing. Very weird. Oh, God. It's really creeping me out. Well, as you can imagine, when the morning came, Alcott was quick to tell the local townsfolk about his encounter. Now, the town was truly buzzing after this. Keep in mind, Alcott was the first person to actually see that there was a creature attached to this light. U.G. Griffith just saw this strange light bopping around. Right. Folks were astonished that even the town doctor, a very well-known and respected man, was claiming that there was this monster stalking their quiet town. The rest of the day remained cloudy as the town anxiously awaited nightfall for when the creature may soon return again. Of course, there were folks thinking there had obviously had to be a reasonable explanation for this, but reason was about to go out the window that very night. The next visit would come that very evening. Our next witness was a man named Clarence Dunn. Now, of all the witnesses, my source claims that Dunn was perhaps the most respected of all the main witnesses. In 1895, Dunn had graduated from Adele High School in a nearby town, after which he continued his education at the Capital City Commercial College. And while there, Dunn began working as a public school teacher. He would graduate from college in 1901. And in 1903, at the time the visitor came to town, Dunn actually worked as a cashier at the local Van Meter Bank. In 1935, when the bank moved to the nearby town of Adele, where he went to high school, Dunn was promoted to bank manager. And he would actually be manager from 1935 until 1947, when ill health forced him to retire. The point of all this is to say Dunn was a very well-respected person in in Van Meter and the surrounding area. He would serve the community later in life in many ways. He became a mayor. He was treasurer and even head of the Van Meter Independent School District. He was also a member of a few different societies. He was a member of the Scottish Rite Masons, a Knight of Pythias, and even a modern Woodsman of America. I have no idea what any of those organizations stand for or anything, right, but, right. Um, but, but I don't know if yeah. they're good or bad, but apparently, like I said, at the time he was a well-liked guy. I, I don't know anything about these secret societies. Yeah. Interesting fact, even though his name was Clarence, most people actually referred to him as Peter, but just a little side note there. So there you go. One of those things, every now and then someone just has a completely different name. 
And maybe it's their middle name, or maybe who could know? Who knows? Well, as the sun set on September 30th, Dunn made his way down to the Van Meter Bank where he worked. Obviously, Dunn would usually be spending the night at home with his wife and family, but on this night, Dunn chose to stay in the bedroom that was set up at the bank. You see, Dunn thought that all this hubbub about a monster stalking Van Meter at night was actually maybe the work of burglars. He was going to stay at the bank that night to protect him. For protection that night, Dunn had with him his shotgun in case things were to get crazy. Oh, yeah. And crazy they surely would be. Oh, no. Dunn was awake, but lying in bed there at that bedroom at the bank when the town clock chimed out at 1 a.m. And right after that chime, that's when Dunn heard a strange noise. Uh, My sources describe the sound as a sort of garbling, gasping sound. Hmm. Dunn had barely gotten out of bed when a blast of blinding light came through the front window. But quickly, the light was off of him and darting around the room as if it was looking for something. And his eyes, they slowly adjusted back to normal, and that's when Dunn caught a look at what the light was coming from. He was able to make out the shape of a very large creature. Just then, the sliding light flashed back over onto him, and out of instinct, Dunn raised his shotgun and shot the creature point-blank right through the window. The powerful blast shattered the window and even the window sash as well. Then, as quickly as the light had appeared, it was gone. The creature was gone. Hmm. As soon as Don broke that morning, a thorough search was conducted. Dunn himself was certain that he had killed the creature, but of course, nothing was found. Nothing except some strange three-toed footprints. Dunn would apparently make a plaster cast of these prints, but... The whereabouts of those casts today are unknown. Chat, real quick, quick side note. I noticed as I was doing this research that throughout all this event, because it just happened over the span of a few nights, it was always lightly raining. Hmm. We'll talk more about that at the end. That was interesting to me. Yeah, this whole story is very interesting. And like the idea with the mines coming up, like this has come up over and over again with different stories. And Sabrina, the chilling adventures of Sabrina. Oh, yeah. This is crazy. Very crazy. So we move on ahead a little bit to that evening. So it's now the evening of Thursday, October 1st. And here we meet our next witness, a Mr. O.V. White. Here's a little background on Mr. White. The O in O.V. stands for Otto. What's interesting is that some of the early newspaper articles that covered the story referred to O.V. White as Dr. O.V. White. And it's very likely that this is because they mixed up witness names. They probably confused O.V. White with Dr. Alcott. Ah, yes. But even though he wasn't a doctor, White was a respected local businessman who was the co-owner of the Fisher & White Hardware and Furniture Store. On the evening of October 1st, O.V. White was actually staying in the second-story apartment that was above the hardware store. As we know, many folks in town thought these monster sightings were actually burglars, so White decided he would stay above the shop out of precaution. White was asleep when suddenly he was jolted awake by a piercing, rasping sound. Immediately, White jumped out of bed and grabbed his gun. The noise continued screeching, and White rushed to the window to see what the heck was making this racket. But the moment he flung open the window, the sound abruptly stopped. He peered into the night as his eyes adjusted to the darkness. And after a few moments, that's when something caught his eye. A brief movement. Whatever it was was standing on the crossbar of a telephone pole. Hmm. Even in the dark, it was clear to White that whatever he was looking at was no human being. As quietly and calmly as he could, White raised his rifle and took aim. Gently exhaling, he fired a shot at the creature, who was only about 15 feet away. But of course, the creature didn't just fall down dead to the street below, but rather, as White would later describe it, it was as if the bullet from his rifle merely woke the creature up. Hmm. The moment the shot rang out, That blinding bright light came on and pointed directly at White. White froze in terror right where he stood, and that's when he noticed an awful, overwhelming odor filling the air that seemed to be coming from the monster. On top of that, White would later claim in interviews that the odor seemed to almost stupefy or incapacitate him. He claimed that other than his encounter with this creature, he would be unable to remember anything else from that night. Wow. So now we got the odor thing again. 
Ew, that's gross as fuck. Something that pops but up a lot in it our It does stories. pop up a lot, yeah. They and it makes sense that it was kind of used to incapacitate him or... Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of get that. Uh, right at the same time that the shot from White's rifle rang out, uh, his neighbor was roused by the sound of it, by the sound of this gunshot, Mr. Sidney Gregg, our next witness. Mr. Gregg is probably the witness we know the least about. We know he was also staying in an apartment at one of the local shops, so it's most likely he either owned a business there or just worked at one. Mm-hmm. Notice how it's all businessmen. Yeah. Well, Sidney Gregg is startled by the sound of this gunshot, so he rushes outside to see what, what's going on. Greg stopped in his tracks and watched in shock as this creature descended down the telephone pole in a way that he would describe as being almost like a parrot. It apparently would use its beak to maneuver its way down. Oh, weird. What the fuck? When it reached the ground, it stood upright, and Greg would claim that the thing had to be at least eight feet tall, like (gasps) the others had said. He was overwhelmed by the stench of the thing and was even more overwhelmed when that light blasted on and appeared to search around the area. But just then, the early morning mail train came rolling into town right on schedule as it did. The noise of the train must have freaked out the creature because, as Greg claims, it sort of flapped its wings and made it large jumps, similar almost like a kangaroo, and then apparently took off on all fours, racing in the direction of the coal mine. Mm. So here we go, coal mines, cave systems. Yes. Oh my goodness. Interdimensional beings or just these creatures that are able to get out that are have been locked in there or oh, something. Yes. Oh, we're going to get into that, my oh, sweet love. Oh, no. What's going on? So now the citizens of Van Meter are truly freaked out. Everyone believes some sort of inhuman creature has come to their quiet town. And can you blame them? I mean, come on. It does kind of sound like a Scooby, like it's like a almost like a Scooby Doo or like a. It reminds me of like old, like the old. I love the old Shadow radio show. Like it reminds me of like the cat that killed this. Like in the end, you find out it's just a. It's not an actual giant cat. It's a guy in a cat costume killing. Mm. It feels very Scooby Doo, doesn't it? Yeah, it it does. Even a local teacher at Van Meter Southside High School named Professor Martin claimed that the creature was quote some sort of antediluvian monster. Now, just to clarify. The official dictionary definition of antediluvian is, quote, of or belonging to the time before the biblical flood. So essentially it means the time, if you were going by the Bible as a a timeline, it would mean the time between the fall of man in the Garden of Eden and the flood. That's like whatever that area is. They would call that the antediluvian. So some sort of ancient monster. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting fact, remember there is a brick and tile factory that was erected by the old defunct coal mine. Well, crews would work at this factory around the clock day and night. And throughout these days while the creature had come to town, crews at the factory had claimed that strange noises would come from the coal mine at all hours of the day and night. But not just like odd noises, but terrifying noises that many described as being, quote, as though Satan and a regiment of imps were coming forth for battle. Remember that? That was something, it was in one of the possession stories we covered. They talked about how it sounded like marching, like legions. Oh, of, yes, that's right. It sounded like legions of Satan and his imps, like mm. coming for it. Yeah, very horrifying. Yeah. Very horrifying stuff. So now we jump forward to the, the very early morning of October 3rd, 1903. This introduces our next witness, J.L. Platt Jr., uh, as we remember, he was the son of J.L. Platt, who started the you know was put in charge of the mine and started right. the factory, and then mm-hmm. died. Yes. Well, he happened to be at the factory that night uh, doing some work, and it was getting close to the hour of one a.m. Oh, why is it always one a.m.? Isn't that weird? Like usually when we talk about, it's always three a.m. Like the witches are, but this is something. To, it's like one a.m. What's with one a.m.? We'll discuss. We'll discuss later. Okay. The sounds were still coming from the old mine, and they had captivated him. It was so strange that Platt himself, even with a group of the workers from the factory, they even walked out of the factory and approached the mouth of the mine. The rain, of course, was slightly drizzling, and just as it had been since this visitor came to town. Platt had reached the mouth of the mine, and the strange sounds were still going on. And that is when the creature emerged from the mine. Its bright light stopped him in his tracks, and he watched in awe as the creature exited the mine, and following right behind him was another slightly smaller Mm. monster. 
Oh my god, there's another one? Both had bright lights emanating from these horns on their heads. Well, obviously Platt and his men are terrified, but they did realize as the creatures left, they had officially found their lair. Right. So thinking on their feet, and keep in mind, this is still 1 a.m. Oh yeah. Platt and the men rounded up a posse of men. They went door to door knocking on doors 1 a.m., rousing men from their beds. And in the dark of the early morning, a large group of heavily armed men surrounded the mouth of the mine and waited to ambush the creatures upon their return. Oh, gosh. They waited for about four hours, wondering if the creature would come back at all. But at around 5.46 a.m. in the morning, just as the first lights of dawn were appearing in the sky, the men saw the creatures emerge. Standing before them were these two hideous, terrifying monsters, and the men unleashed a hail of gunfire that one witness said could have, quote, sunk the Spanish fleet. Oh, my God. They apparently, it was literally a barrage, like this posse, all of them armed, just unloaded. Oh. Boom, boom, but like literally like a, just a barrage of bullets. Yeah, wow. But to their shock and their horror, the men soon realized that all their bullets had no effect on the creatures standing before them. All they did was make annoyed and awful sounds. And they watched as both creatures just casually climbed back down into the depths of the mine. They were in no rush. Hmm. They were kind of annoyed, but they were in no rush. Well, during that day after the sun rose, the men heavily barricaded the entrance to the mine. Now, were the creatures able to exit a different way? Were they just trapped down there forever? Whatever the answer is... This was actually the last time the creatures would be seen in Van Meter. Yeah, that checks out. So before we go to theories, here are some things about this story I want to discuss. The creatures always seem to come out at 1 a.m. and return right at dawn, very vampire-like. Yeah. Getting back down, but why 1 a.m.? Why 1 a.m.? That is so weird. Yeah. I wonder what that what that is about. That's just... I. I I don't have any ideas or thoughts or theories on why that would be. Because if these, let's say these are not, let's say these are straight up flesh and blood cryptids. Right. You know, rather than something supernatural that might operate on, you know, like 3 a.m., which is a, why 1 a.m.? You know what I mean? Right, that is yeah, weird. right, yeah. And what do they do in that time? Keep in mind, like, no one was, like, attacked or eaten. Mm, right. So it's like, what are they doing? Why are they leaving the cave? Why are or they, the like, mine? Wh- what do they do? What do they do for food? And also, like, what were they looking for? They would poke their head. They would. It was like they were looking into buildings and stuff. Yeah, why were they looking into buildings? That almost kind of leads it lends itself to the whole Scooby-Doo thing, whereas, like, what if these were burglars in a costume and they're, like, yeah. trying to scare people away but maybe steal shit? You know what I mean? I'm not, I don't think that's what it was, but, like, it it does it's, it is like what were they looking for? They didn't seem to actually want to harm anyone. But if it was people in a costume, those bullets would have killed them. So oh, that yeah. checks that off. The, also, right. What's with the odor? Yeah, that's something that pops up in a lot of stories, whether it's paranormal stories, UFO stories. The smell. Mm-hmm. What's with the noises coming from the mine and stuff? Well, obviously, what's with the horn of light? Maybe yeah, the horn of light is wild. You know, you think of, uh, you know, I think of like y- you see pictures of like fish that leave d- that live yes. deep, deep, I ugly was thinking motherfuckers. The same thing, yes. And they got like the little light bulb in their head. Ugly motherfuckers. Like maybe theory is maybe these are actual creatures that have lived underground for millennia, and they have like that's how they right. Y- you know what I mean? They have just evolved to have a light. Exactly. And why would these few days in autumn of 1903 be the first and last time these creatures were ever seen? Right. Well, because when because it, it's like maybe they were aroused when the coal mine was was opened, and when people when it was closed, that's people weren't coming in and out of there all the time. So then they felt like they could exit. Right. Maybe, maybe it opened a thing that wasn't there before, and they were just curiously look. Yeah. Right. So now let's talk about these theories. And and the book actually the bulk of the book focuses on theories. Like, the actual timeline of events and stuff is actually kind of a smaller portion of the book. Mm -hmm. And it goes into great detail. As we know, it seems that over just a few days, the creatures were seen for the first and last time. One theory is that it hasn't been the first and last time that these things were seen. That they've been seen elsewhere, but just described and identified in different ways. The author lists 
other sightings, think about the Jersey Devil. Right. It's kind of got a similar look. What about the Native American legend of, of Thunderbirds? Yeah. Things like that. People want, and, you know, and it lists off all sorts of sightings. You know, I won't go into it because we'd be, it's like I said, th- this is the thickest part of the book. But what if these things have been seen before? It's just people interpreted them differently. Right. Or maybe people have seen them, but not really reported it because they weren't sure of what they saw. Exactly. Right. Was this a good old fashioned case of mass hysteria? The source actually compares it to that story we covered, the other one, the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. Mm -hmm. The source points this out. This was interesting. I'll, I'll quote this here. One of the main hallmarks of mass hysteria involves the sudden onset of irrational thinking and or behavior accompanied by inexplicable symptoms of illness, like getting sick from the phantom gasser. Now, remember one of the witnesses said he couldn't really remember anything after the gas. Right. Now, could it have also been a hoax? I mean, how were so many people on it and like, yeah, you can't, it just... you can't shoot a, a hoax a hundred times and it's still walking around. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. And lots of people just think that didn't really happen that way or something. Right, maybe, yeah. Now, what's interesting is the mine has actually long been filled in, and it's actually hard to find now. It, it was it was there, but, like, it's been filled in, and it's kind of the way the Earth has just kind of reclaimed it. It's, it's kind of hard to find. Right. The tile factory has long been abandoned and is in a very dilapidated state. And many folks, very interesting, claim that this factory is haunted, with strange lights being seen in it and terrifying noises coming from it, much like the noises that were heard in the mine shaft. People say ghosts will throw bricks and tile at folks who get too close. And of course, folks have even theorized that maybe these creatures had extraterrestrial ties. And uh, we'll focus more on the haunting bit. It doesn't really relate to the story that much, but I'm going to talk a little more about it on our Patreon. Okay, I like that. Now, the most interesting theory, and it's one that we are fascinated by here on Creepstream, is the notion of the ultra-terrestrial. Okay, go on. The source does a great deep dive into Van Meter and the surrounding area, and for centuries, all manner of strange things had been sighted in the area well before the events of 1903. Everything from monsters in the nearby Raccoon River to UFOs in the sky. Perhaps these creatures are interdimensional travelers. Perhaps there is some sort of rift near the town of Van Meter that allows all these strange things to cross over from time to time. Here's an interesting quote from John Keel himself. I have adopted the concept of ultra-terrestrials, beings and forces which coexist with us but are on another time frame. That is, they operate outside the limits of our space-time continuum, yet have the ability to cross over into our reality. This is not a place, but is a state of energy. And even the notion of people getting ill around these things is not new. To quote my source, Legends also mention of unwary travelers, who could be struck by elf shot, a sort of magical projectile or beam that paralyzes, sickens, or strokes the victim dumb. All are also common symptoms following alleged alien contact. Wow. So that's weird. So it's like, that's another thing that makes you think that all of these things are kind of connected in some way. Aliens, cryptids. Right. You know, I don't know. It's weird. So we will leave you here with a quote from one of the authors of the book I used as a source, Kevin Lee Nelson, in an interview that he gave. That's the big question. What was the Van Meter visitor? In the book, we explore a wide variety of theories, from the mundane hoax to mass hysteria to more exotic ones like a possible ultra-terrestrial. The odd part about the Van Meter visitor is that it exhibited a number of bizarre and unearthly traits. A horn that projected a bright light beam, metallic sounds, and immunity to gunfire. I can't speak for my co-authors, but I tend to put it in the ultra-terrestrial category, much like Mothman due to its seemingly paraphysical nature. In fact, the features of the Van Meter case are so similar to events of the Mothman case that one could consider it a proto-Mothman event, as it happened 60 years before the events in Point Pleasant. The overpowering sulfur-like odor is also a common trait associated with alleged ultra-terrestrials like Florida's skunk ape, which got its name from its terrible smell. Like John Keel and Jacques Vallée, one of our working theories is that many paranormal events and encounters may all fall under the umbrella of ultra-terrestrial phenomena. Wow, and it makes you think maybe is this thing connected to the Mothman in some way? Maybe. 
And I know our listeners love a good Mothman tale. Yeah. The Mothman is like the center. He's the common denominator in everything. And so much. We're saving. Obviously, we haven't done our Mothman episode yet, but we've done things tangentially related to it. Can't wait to finally dive into that. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Me as well. Well, Dylan, thank you for doing all that fantastic research. Of course. my Of course, my love. And everyone out there, if you have any thoughts or theories or questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us on social media, or you can email us directly at creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com. Well, I got a list of names I wouldn't mind shining a light into my window in the early hours of the morn. Um, okay. Folks, the names of our top-tier Patreon subscribers. Of course, the Dream James Watkins, the Finnish Face Via Alungfus, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oh-So-Suave Sean Richardson, the British Bone Breaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vavilli, the Loathsome Johnny Love, the Carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the killer stud Carl Staub, the fire starter Heather Carter, the conqueror Christopher Damien Damaris, the awfully awesome Annie, the murderous Maggie Leach, the sir of sexy Sam Hackworth, the evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire Hernandez Lopez, the maniacal Laura Maynard, the vicious Karen Van Buren, the arch nemesis Aaron Bird, the sadistic Sergio Castillo, the rapscallion Ryan Crum, the beast Benjamin Huang, the devilish Chris Doucette, the psycho Sam, the electric Emily Jong, the ghoulish Gert Hankum, and the renegade Corey Ramo. Thank you so much to everyone, all of our listeners, but a special shout out to our Patreon subscribers and a special, special shout out to our top tier Patreon subscribers. We love you all so much. We're so happy to have you as members of the Creep Street Homeowners Association. And gosh darn it, we just love you so much. Love you. We do. Of course, like, rate, subscribe, give us a thumbs up or a five stars on whatever outlet you listen to us on. And of course, evangelize the good name of Creep Street. Please. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night and goodbye. Goodbye.